Welcome to the second day of the 13th annual Ashland Independent Film Festival. You're at the free filmmaker talk back um, this morning, not the same old story. We have a really exciting panel for you. Um, thank you so much for coming. It's really great to see such a crowd. I think I've said this before, but uh, even seven years ago when we started these panels, we had them in a little room that held about 20 people and four showed up and now we have this great um, attendance. So it's very exciting. Um, I'm gonna just introduce our moderator. He will introduce our special guests. Um, we do have actually our Rogue Award honoree this year, Mark Monroe with us. Um, Warren will talk a little bit more about that. Woo! Yeah, so it's very exciting to have him here in town. And uh, Jeff Malmberg is an alumni of the film festival. His film, Marwin Call, played here a few years ago. And a uh, really amazing film. <laughs> Sorry to take um, And I think many of you recognize Warren. He's moderated a number of panels here. He is just a pro at this. Um, he's also the MC of our awards ceremony a few years and does an awesome job there. Um, he has conducted, I think, over 2,500 interviews at last count, something like that. So <laughs> these guys are in good hands. Um, he is also the uh, producer and um, host of The High Bar, dedicated to raising the bar, and um, has a new show. I need to look at my notes. I realize it just started on PBS, Real Northwest. So can we see it here? Yeah, he'll tell you more about that. I'm looking forward to it. Um, so I'd like to hand over the mic to Warren and let him get started. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joanne. <laughs> it is a show called Real Northwest. I pray it plays in the Northwest, it would seem. <laughs> I'm not taking that for granted, but uh, we'll see. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. It really is amazing to see this many uh, folks turn out in the morning uh, for any sort of conversation, uh, particularly one I'm involved with. Uh, but uh, not totally surprising because we have two fantastic guests with us today to discuss uh, finding story within documentary, which is a fascinating thing. And as your attendance proves, I think documentary has become a more exciting uh, form on some level than narrative features, frankly. That's right, I said it. It's crazy. It's going to get more controversial after this. Uh, so <laughs> we're joined on my, my far right by a uh, fabulous director and editor, uh, Jeff uh, Malmberg, whose uh, film uh, Marwin Call won the uh, Truer Than Fiction uh, Award at the Independent Spirit Awards. Round of applause for that. Right there. He's edited a, a, a number of films with Tom Putnam also, who's a terrific filmmaker and a number of projects, but brings his own particular uh, uh, style and take on the work to us today. And next to me is a man who uh, won the Writer Guild of America um, Best Documentary Screenplay Award for The Cove um, and has also been involved with so many uh, major documentary features of the past few years, including uh, Chasing Ice and Stolen Seas. I always mention that even though people haven't seen it because I really like it that much. Uh, and this year have Fed Up coming out about the childhood obesity uh, epidemic, working with Katie Couric. <gasps> uh, and of course, uh, has a movie playing tomorrow morning, which I, I really uh, urge you to see Mission Blue, uh, 930 at the Armory, which is a, a terrific piece about Sylvia Earle. Uh, he is also, of course, the Rogue Award winner this year. Round of applause for Mark Monroe. Thank you. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> My work is done. <laughs> uh, so when we talk about narrative features, there's this old adage that uh, that the film is written three times, in the script stage, in production, and in editing. Does the same hold true for documentaries? Or is there a fourth stage? Jeff Malmberg for The Block. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think maybe the difference is that um, a lot of times the tricky part of it and the wonderful part of it, if you can hold on tight enough, is that it's re entirely rewritten three times, you know, that it's not an additive process, but it's also sometimes a reductive process. And, and it's a realigning of your understanding of that material, um, much more so, I would assume, than narrative. Mm -hmm. I don't know if your experience is the same, but. Yeah, I'm, um, I would say more than three times. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'm really busy. <laughs> uh, no, uh, 
friend of mine, a good, a great filmmaker, Stacy Peralta, once told me that uh, he felt that documentaries were written all the time, uh, seemingly, because they're written when you write the questions, just when you, when you get the interview list. And then when you write the questions, you're, you're actually writing the film uh, in, a, in a way. And then when you get the responses and you look through um, the responses that you take you by surprise and lead you in new directions, you're writing it again. Mm -hmm. You're writing it uh, before you go in the edit bay, you're writing it when you get in the edit bay. And then when you get the full cut, you start back over from the beginning and you, you can start all over and create the world anew again based on the reaction you get. So uh, there's, uh, it could be considered scary, I guess, but there's a lot more opportunity in documentaries to throw out the old and bring in the new to, to reshape uh, the world, whereas in, in narratives, when you write the script and you shoot the scenes, they don't really like you to go back and reshoot the whole movie. <laughs> no, no, you know, but, but I would recommend it on occasion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, when it doesn't work out in the anime and documentaries, you can just kind of go, well, let's, yeah. let's shuffle it up and start over and figure out what we, where we went wrong and recreate this world brand new again, and you can do that. So. Right. That's why that process sometimes takes people multiple years. Right? Very, very true. <laughs> <laughs> but, but considering this, this organic nature of the documentary, that the thing is constantly changing, that it is that amorphous, who provides that guiding vision? <laughs> well, I, I, I seriously always think the director does. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I think, you know, they're the ones that stepped in it first, as they say, right. and, <laughs> and, uh, and are, were driven. Because uh, a lot of these guys and girls, women, ladies, uh, men, they, they take on these films. <laughs> Transgendered people. Yes. They take on these films, <laughs> and, and they don't really know what they're getting into, okay. essentially. I think the documentary has become this kind of uh, avenue for people to communicate something that happened to them. If you look at the, the number of documentaries that come out every year or, or are made every year, um, you know, there's maybe 20 or 30 people who make them over and over again, right. and about 95% of these people are making them for the first time. And that's because the, the documentary has become an avenue for them to communicate something, to tell a story that they have somehow found themselves caught up in and feel like they have to share it with the rest of the world. And the great you know, um, wave of technology that's overcome us has allowed us to take pictures and video so easily and put it on a computer and edit it and add music. And, and it's become a, a, a great avenue for people to tell stories. Uh, and and you know, they don't sometimes realize what they're getting into when they do it, though. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. It, it kind of <laughs> consumes their life, and it's two or three years, and it becomes this thing that they just have to get out. It's so. the double-edged sword of access. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Right. And, yeah, I agree with you. I think, ultimately, it's the director. But the nice thing about documentary is, uh, to me, is that it's a very intimate relationship when you work but you can usually do it as opposed to with narrative with one other person or a few other people. And that it's, so you always need that filter of the director, but that filter is lar sometimes largely influenced at certain points by other people that you trust. And you know, it does take so long that, to me, one of the things that's really fun about it that on Marwan Call we did was, it was myself and, and um, four of my, my wife and three of my friends working on the film. So it was really this nice long conversation that you get to have with the sub between the subject and yourself, between yourself and your crew, and between yourself, the film and the audience, you know. So, although it is a director, I think that director, if they're smart, is constantly kind of listening and listening and listening to both the subjects and the crew members around them, you know. Well, Mark mentioned this thing about how a lot of people are going in because they have to express something. Is that what happened with Marwan Call? Mm. <coughs> I mean, I kind of came at documentary uh, from an editorial place, and I, I although uh, I directed Marwan Call and continue am working on a film that I'm currently directing, editing, I really feel like primarily an editor. Like the directing part's sort of like, if I can just get through it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> then I'll be safely in a room where I can think about it and things like that. Um, and I think you know, a lot of the people I talk to are either identify as directors as either primarily camera people or editorial people, and I, th I think it kind of can break down in that way, and I'm always gonna be an editor. Uh, and, and frankly, the reason I wanted to, in a, you were asking how I started on Marvel Call, it wasn't the ability or the need to express something, but I had cut a documentary, that film that you mentioned, Red, White, Black, and Blue, and um, it just was like, 
this editorial, like, it was, it was just, as an editor, it was sort of what I'd been working up towards, and I realized how much you could do editorially in documentary, and I thought, if I could be the director of something, then I, no one could tell me no, basically, because, <laughs> because at the end of the day, as the editor, rightly so, you're, you're in second position. Right. You know what I mean? So if it's something you care about, it kind of serves you to direct because then you have the you know final cut, basically. So Jeff is clearly a control freak. Mark. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay, fine. Yeah. Fair enough. I, I do, but I do think, I, I do think he's, he's hit it on the head in that I, I don't think any director of documentaries in the world will, will uh, argue the fact that this is an editor genre. And that's what I was saying before. You can recreate the world at any moment. You can take any avenue you want to, as opposed to a narrative film that you've shot based on the blueprint of a script, and the, you know you only have the scenes so many ways. Yes, you can juggle the order, but you still only have those scenes. Right. And in the documentary world, you can literally just take a left turn when you want it, and sometimes you need to. And when it works, it's magic. And so, uh, and that happens in the editing room, not not you know, out saying action and cut and stuff like that. It happens in the editing room, so. Well, talk about your, your process, because you are often working with editors and, and, and helping them theoretically craft the story in some manner. What is that dynamic like? It's great, because uh, I, um, I never really made a full living as an editor, but I worked as an editor for many years, and the first job I had out of school, like, you know, generations ago, seemingly, was as an editor, um, a machine-to-machine -machine editor. Uh, and and so uh, I'm I'm trying to think like an editor when I'm working with them, and I think they appreciate that. And I, I'm not I've never like written a script and given it you know to an editor and said there you go here's your film <laughs> see you in four months. <laughs> I I work basically maybe uh, a scene ahead or a couple pages ahead, and it's mm -hmm. a it's a, always a give and take where I'm I'm kind of like um, trying to trying to keep the bigger picture in mind while giving them kind of scenes to work on. Um, and it's not prescriptive, it's just uh, how I think it could play. And it, it kind of gives them a, a big chunk of clay to deal with. And they interpret those pages in their own way and send them back to me. And it's a, it's a great kind of um, conversation. It's always uh, um, kind of igniting each other and, and, and pushing us forward. Yeah, and, and I'm always kind of going back and then going forward and going back and going forward. And the editor is slowly just marching. And right. so <laughs> I, I feel like I just got to stay ahead, you know, just keep running, <laughs> stay ahead. But it's a, it's a very fun process. And I think I've had a, a couple times I've had editors kind of wary. They've never worked with a writer, or the, 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 you know. But once you do it for like a week, they get hooked. It's like it's <laughs> a lot of fun because I think editing, uh, for me anyway, was about kind of, Blocking everything out and concentrating on the minutiae of just that beat, that moment, that thing right there, right in front of you. And when you do that, sometimes you're not thinking about the broader picture. And so right. it allows me to think of the bigger picture for them, in a way. So, Where does the director fit into that? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Yeah. Is, is, shouldn't it be her or his it, or its guiding vision? It, 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 <laughs> It is their guiding vision, and it, it, you know I don't I don't ever get a job without you know um, you know several long involved conversations with uh, directors, and and when I'm working, it's based on a kind of a overall outline that I've worked out with the director, saying uh, you know what do you have? This is where I think it could go. Let's talk about it, what will happen if we if we do it like this. Mm -hmm. And so there's a kind of a big picture that the director and I are. are Agreeing on, and then he's seeing the pages, and he's seeing the scenes, and he's, or she, or it, <laughs> are, uh, you know, they're commenting the whole time. Uh, they're they're part of the, you know, a big part of the process, because no one wants to, you know, shoot a film and then, you know, have it be kind of taken down a road that they didn't want to go down. So, right, yeah. It's interesting, though. I mean, your your job, you're at the seemingly at the top of your field in the documentary screenwriter. That you're you're in great demand, certainly. A huge field it is, by the way. <laughs> well, one of the advantages right there. But, but you're also sort of like a leprechaun. I mean, uh, up until recently, the WGA didn't even recognize documentary screenwriters. And so this is a, this is a growing field. What, what happened there? 
<laughs> I don't really know. I where, just where, woke up did one you just day all suddenly I, appear? The thing is, I mean, <laughs> I, we were laughing earlier about uh, um, reality television, and I'm really in this only because I didn't want to do reality television, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> and and I, I am making uh, uh, television-style documentaries, of which I still make sometimes to mm -hmm. pay the bills, uh, that are, you know, biography-style, one-hour-type television documentaries. And in those... You are writing and you are directing and you are editing and you're doing all the things that you do in documentary film. You're just being guided by a set formula. Uh, and so I only got into it because, you know, some people I had worked with in the past were like, well, how do we do this? <laughs> and I'm like, well, we could do it just like we did the TV, only we, we won't be bound by the formula. Right. And I began getting calls and jobs that way. I, I you know, I think anyone who has a job in, in, in um, entertainment feels like, ah, they're pretty lucky. And I, I'm the same way. I, I did some work with some guys who turned out to be, you know, make a lot of films, very prolific. And so I got a lot of phone calls. That's basically it. That's it. Jeff, this this idea of your your rush to get to the edit room uh, is that because you're antisocial or uh, <laughs> you don't want that much footage? What's that right. about? <laughs> it's it's really both. Um, <laughs> so, um, no, I mean I I just it, when you're it's not the position I'm the most comfortable in. You know, integrating with the subjects I love, but mm -hmm. it's just not how I relate to the footage. I'm just always going to be thinking. I, I, to me, what's interesting is not what's being said, but what's not being said. Like, the, to me, the documentary has this great ability to deal with kind of the unspoken and, and that kind of thing that we all sort of feel at the moment, but it's like you wake up afterwards and you can't really describe it or something. So I think there's a lot of interesting places you can go in that. And I you know, I'm only saying this now thinking about it, it's not like I consciously do this, but, you know, um, in the things that I find myself working on and being interested in wanting to devote years of, of work to, it's it's those kind of things. And I, to me, that's best accomplished editorially, you know. Um, I, I love shooting. I just don't find myself to be all that great at it. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just not like, uh, you know, I, I think I'm great at, at getting to know my subject. Mm -hmm. And there's 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 power in that, you know what I mean. But it's just not. I know people who are like, I love shooting; it's so much fun, and I just could never. And you know, <laughs> I mean, on the last film that my wife and I just shot, um, we were in Italy for six months, shooting every day in a town in a hill town. Sounds awful. With fifty, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so if, 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 if that's not if that's not enjoyable, you know, you, you know, it's it's not uh, your favorite thing in the world, but. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, it's, um, you know, most people would die to be in that situation. And to me, you know, although I love all those people and I, I enjoyed meeting them, it, getting up and shooting was not what I was looking forward to doing. <laughs> so. I mean, think of it this way, though. I mean, uh, we, again, it's this narrative versus documentary thing. When you, when you get excited to go shoot a narrative film, I mean... You are already imagining everything in your yeah, mind. Yeah, and it's shoot. your crane shot is like, oh, we're doing that crane exactly. shot today. <laughs> and, you know, but I mean, I do get it. I'm not trying to put down shooting. I'm just saying that I, it's more saying I vibe as an editor, you know, and, and all, all it, that to me is where documentary gets really interesting. And, you know, I mean, you can call it writing or you can call it editing. What it is is playing with those rules, knowing what those rules are, knowing, and frankly, using those kind of television ideas that we're all aware of that's kind of the language and, and playing off of them and and sometimes using them wholly and sometimes working against it and sometimes surprising people and sometimes you know so you know to me it's like that's why mark's probably so good at what he does is because he knows those rules and but he knows he doesn't have to use them if he if it doesn't work because that's the fun too is is being surprised by a documentary and 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 you know going a place you didn't quite expect even though you feel like you're in good hands all the way I think the shooting of them is actually the scariest part, again, because your whole job is to go out and capture something that you don't know is going to happen. I mean, that's, that's what the documentary is, is to be there when it happens, not, not make it happen, but just capture it. And so to set out and shoot it is a scary thing, whereas when you set out to shoot a narrative, you've storyboarded everything, you know what the point of every scene is, you know how you want it to play in your mind. But, you know, if you want to capture a story, a documentary story, 
you got to have patience. You have months of time, a lot yeah. of times, and you've got to and sit and wait. And a lot of it, wait and listen. You know, a lot of your job there is just sort of taking it all in too, before you can comment on it or play with it. You know, your your job is to just sit there and, and listen to it. Um, how many people have seen Warren Call? Yeah. Um, I, I'm curious because that unfolds like it was one him doing one telling of a story essentially, which is pretty. But how long did that actually take? How many times were you chatting with him? How many hours? I mean, it was four years that I shot. Okay. It. <laughs> um, so he lived in New York. I think I probably went um, 15 times or something. Mm -hmm. And um, because it was a function of that, like you were saying, rewriting where you think you're doing one thing. I thought I was doing a short mm -hmm. that was about this guy who was beat up in real life, who plays with dolls in his fantasy life and isn't that <laughs> clever. You know what I mean? And then you start, it's, that's to me what's interesting about documentary too. It's like constantly um, revising your expectations and beating them, you know what I mean? And so it, by the end, what I wanted to do was set up a narrative that allowed you to fall into those same traps too. Where that I had, where you're sort of convinced you understand someone, and it's like shifting floors where they kind of, you're constantly surprised by the humanity of this person, um, somebody who you might initially dismiss or something. So, because that was my experience of it. So, um, you know, it was a function of each trip sort of cast the last trip in a new light. You know what I mean? How'd you know when to stop? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> uh, well, my, my wife is doing a book with, I, I had the uh, advantage of, um, I knew I couldn't fit this whole story into a movie. I'd have to get rid of things. So also too, it's like, that's nice. I think especially in character stuff where an audience with questions is a good thing. You know, like you don't actually want to answer everything. Like you want to inspire people to, move forward and think about it and things like that. So I knew I could drop some stuff, but then my wife I knew was doing a kind of book. Like I didn't know what this movie was gonna be, so I always thought of it as like a great, I love art books, so I thought okay, somebody's gonna do an art book and this will be in the back of the art book. And like this will be like some weird documentary <laughs> about this guy, <laughs> you know, which it is, but it's like, you know. And so hopefully we're actually hoping that when the book is done we can like put it in the back because they'll work well together. <laughs> so I knew I, w I had this like, this book, 500 page book that, because you know, the subject was so big ultimately hmm. that I knew, and, and, and it became about one certain thing really. Like how does this person want to re-identify in their second life after being beat up as a male heterosexual crossdresser, which you would never describe the movie in that way. But right. to me, that's sort of the thread of the film. <laughs> and if you haven't seen it now, I know you want to rush out yeah, and see it. I just spoiled right it for everyone. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Once again, we're getting back to this thing of, of finding the story itself. When you go in, Mark, and you're looking at a project, do you approach it a, a, as a writer would for a, a fiction story of finding a three-act structure? Um, well, by the time... A lot of my uh, gigs have been, I, I come in actually late. People um, have been working on it for uh, some time. They've shot a lot of material. Sometimes they even have a cut. And so, yeah, in those situations. Are they crying at that point? No, <laughs> not all of them. <laughs> not all of them. Uh, no, not at all. I think, I, think, I think what happens to a lot of people, I mean, it's, I think Jeff made an amazing, amazing film, and I think, a huge part of that is the fact that he was from the editorial side and he is an editor and he understands what it means to try to capture the essence of a story versus trying to kind of put your whole experience in the film. You, and that's, that's, that's interesting that you say that because when I talk to people, you know, one of the great things about documentaries, everybody's so willing to like call people and, right. and help out. And um, when people call and they're stuck, it's always that, now that you say it, it's always this like, but it's also about this. Right. And it's also about this. And it's, and I, I don't know, sometimes, but now that you say that, that's a lot of the. A lot of my uh, jobs have seemed to me that they follow a familiar pattern when I come in late on a film. And that is that the filmmaker has tried to relive his or her exact experience and put it into the film. And you just, you can't do that. It's impossible to do. What you have to do is relive the, the emotion of it. 
and figure out the emotion of the experience the filmmaker had and try to figure out the best way to communicate that in 80 minutes. And, and so a lot of the times I get these films and they're, you know, they're very long and in places they're kind of tedious because they're very meaningful to the person who was behind the camera or in the room at that time. They're so meaningful to that person that those days meant so much to them personally, but you don't get it. Like <laughs> sitting there watching it doesn't mean anything to you. <laughs> and so a lot of my uh, job is to try to figure out from the person who filmed it, who, who it has holds such meaning, what, you know, what emotions are tied to these scenes and how do we replicate that in a, in, a, in a more palatable way for an audience. And so I look at everything that's been shot and I talk to them about what everything means and then I try to reorder it that keeps that emotion but makes it more exciting in a kind of a mystery way for an audience. And that's, I think, a lot more uh, interesting way than I've seen some people deal with it, which is like, oh, you, you're just fooling yourself. You know, get rid of that, which is like, Half right, but but to take that, figure out where that is coming from and that emotion, and and try and plug it in in a different way. That's really uh, that could lead because it's scary. I think when people just cut that off and and leave that leg or arm or whatever aside and never touch never it, never go back to it. Yeah, because it is the umbilical cord, so to speak. It's that thing that got you to that story. So it's got to enter the film somewhere. Right. But like you say, the essence of it. Right. Yeah. A lot, of, and that's the other scary thing. The, the thing I was saying earlier about what's so fantastic about documentaries—you can recreate the world, you can start over. This is also a huge problem because film filmmakers, first-time filmmakers, they'll they'll do this thing where they try to recreate their experience and they'll have some really magic moments in there, but they'll be told that it's unwatchable, and they'll just throw <laughs> everything out. Right. You know, and it's like, no, oh, don't throw that part <laughs> out. But you know, let's figure out how to make that part the the good part. Uh, but because you can just start over, sometimes they do, and it's you know painful. So I'll, I'll work with people sometimes and go back two or three cuts back and go, oh my gosh, right? You had that, right? You know, yeah. and I, I'm like, what, what, what? Whose decision was to lose this? Totally. <laughs> when, when I show cuts to my friends now, like I have the, something called the bench, which is like yeah. after we have a drink, the hip pocket. Th yeah, there's 30 minutes of like stuff I just recently cut out, yeah. and half the time it's like. What were you thinking? <laughs> you know, this is the movie right there, and they're right. You know, but but in order to get to this place, you had to do it or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and you you were otherwise you would be totally unaware yeah, yeah. that you know that part was necessary. What do you call it? The the hip pocket. The hip pocket. So you do the same thing. Yeah, stick it in the hip pocket. Yeah, put it yeah. in the bin that you know you're going to go back to. Right, right. Because you know, yeah. it's important. It's yeah, it's like got that bin has to have like three stars. Yeah, and exactly. Green. <laughs> three stars. Yeah. Up at the yeah. top. Yeah. So like six months later, this this meant something. <laughs> yeah. Totally. When the new editor gets it, he'll know where to look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's when you know you're in trouble as an editor. It's like, be sure and mark all the bins. Is my job done here? Yeah. Totally. <laughs> So I'm fascinated by this idea of the essence because working when I'm working with the narrative screenwriters, you often get into that same conversation, and I'll ask just the question, what is this movie about? Not plot-wise, but what is it about at its core? What are you really trying to get at? And that same thing I'll find is they'll have gone through a dozen drafts and say, let's go back to the first draft for a second, and maybe we can find it again. But how do you get filmmakers uh, or projects, how do you identify that essence? How do you get to that? Well, I, I mean, I use the word intent a lot, uh, what, you know, because again, I'm getting sometimes cuts of the film already, and I say, you know, what was your intent? What, what is the intent of this particular moment? What, what are we, why are we going here now? Uh, and I think that's always very helpful, um, because, it, you know, it, it still always needs to be the vision of that person who spent those years. Right. And so, um, and I think it's incredibly helpful when you actually get a cut of the film that you're, you're somewhat pleased with and you think, oh, you know, let's show this to some people, to remember that intent so that when the lights come up and everyone has questions or they have problems with certain issues, you can match, you can, you can hold up your intent with their reaction and see where it is uh, there was a disconnect. The, 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 the thing that you were trying to communicate to them, they didn't get it doesn't matter what their solutions are to the problem. What matters is they didn't get the thing that you were trying to say to them. Yep. And so I always come back to that word intent. What is, your, what is the intent of this film? What is the intent of this scene? Why are we doing this here? Um, and that's, that's kind of my driving force. So. 
Well, we, we have spoken a lot about the Cove in the past, but uh, taking, and most people have seen the Cove, haven't you? Yes, good, okay. Uh, <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> really? How many people have seen the Cove? Sh show of hands. That's right. Okay. Well. So many people come and they say, "Oh, you you, you worked in the oh my god, I couldn't see the film, but I, I hear it's <laughs> I hear that all the time. I hear it's fantastic. It's a date movie. Um, but in in that film, seemingly the intent would have been clear from the beginning. Is that well fair to say? <coughs> don't, that was a, don't kill dolphins. Don't kill dolphins. That that was a uh, <laughs> look. That was a glorious, crazy, unbelievable opportunity thing that happened that it could never happen again, I don't mm -hmm. think. I don't know. But it was never intended to be a movie. It was intended to be a series of kind of webisodes to, to raise awareness about different ocean issues. Mm -hmm. And Louis, uh, the director of the film, who has had an amazing career as a fantastic photojournalist, um, the top of his game, a storyteller with very few peers in, in a different medium. Mm -hmm. He stumbled into this story and met this guy, Rick O'Berry, and he could not let it go. And he spent more money than he had, and he spent, took more time than he had, and he chased it, and he chased it. And I didn't, I didn't come in until you know, he had been on it for three or four years. And, uh, and, uh, and so the intent of that film became, how do you get people to want to see a film <laughs> about dolphins being killed? <laughs> because uh, on the face of it, I almost tried, tried to turn the project down like two or three times because I thought, no one is going to watch this. I'm like, God, are you kidding me? And it became slowly, how, how do you tell a story so that they'll want to see what happened? Mm -hmm. um, because if you just say, oh, it's the Dolphin Slaughter film, <laughs> you know, who wants to go see that? You know, it's like, uh, and he had shot all this stuff. I've told this story many times, but he had shot all this stuff because he's a tech head. He's a gearhead. And he had shot all this stuff of him and his crew actually just trying to get the cameras in. And he thought it would be like a great DVD extra. Mm -hmm. And w you know, once I was told about this and we started looking at it, we were like, oh, that's how you do it. You, know? you, you get people to root for the humans. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that by the end of the film, you're like, oh my god, they did it. I can't believe it. <laughs> and now I have to watch what they did. You know? And it, you kind of take. You, you kind of make people have to see it because they've been working so hard on the side of the humans to, to want them to be successful. Right. So that's what it became. To trick them into watching yeah, the Yeah, to, to raise awareness, to trick them into <laughs> watching it. It, it became, uh, you know, how, how do you expose uh, uh, something that should never happen right. uh, and, and make sure that people are willing to see it and not just turn away. So. One of the things that uh, you've talked about uh, in the past is, is how much uh, dolphin slaughter you actually see. And it is sort of deceiving because people think they're going to walk into some sort of aquatic snuff <laughs> film or something. But right. it, it's not, you, you really don't see that much. No, it's, it's like 90 <laughs> seconds. It's not actually that much at all. Right. And in fact, w one of the things that, uh, um, well, that happened, that one of the notes that we got after one of our initial screenings was that we were, you know, underplaying it. Right. We were so, <laughs> if you can imagine that, we were, we were so worried about the reaction that we were like, you know, showing very little of it from wide angles and stuff like that. And, you know, a great editor partner of mine said, you know what, you have you know, strung us out for 80 minutes. You have to <laughs> club us over the head with this right. stuff. Like, you can't, you know. And he was so right. He was dead on. So, yeah. But it's, it's really only... Uh, about 90 seconds at the end of the film. There are several very, like, the tougher scenes to me. There's a couple tougher scenes to me that you're not actually seeing, you know, anything, but it's you're living through the emotions of the people in the film, and right. they're very, uh, they're very hard to watch. Right. And it's just literally because your heart is kind of aching at the same time. It's not, it's not visually, you know, um, you know, through the through the fingers material. It's literally that you're just kind of in in, in the emotion of the moment. So. Well, it does seem like, you know, just like any film, that it's the emotional component that makes something work or not, eventually. It can be as academic as you like, but the emotion has to work. How do you guys find the emotional core through line as you're, as you're working through it? I mean, I, it's interesting to hear your approach to it, because I think that I have people around me that I can say that I direct and edit myself, but I have people around me as producers who 
kind of serve that purpose because I think you need that um, because you can get kind of lost and, and sometimes you should get lost in the footage and sort of swim around in places you don't know <laughs> and, 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 and see what happens, but you always need somebody to like airlift you out and slap you around <laughs> and be like, don't forget, <laughs> this is the movie you're making. Um, and, um, and you really do need that. And in the way you were describing working with an editor, I think it's very much that, like I always think of it like a ladder, like you're kind of leapfrogging up a ladder and you really do need two people. It's, it's, it's kind of solitary work and yet you can't do it entirely by yourself. Well, some people do, but uh, these kind of films I don't think you can do by yourself. Um, so, uh, I'm sorry, I'm winging here. The, the, the question, no, I'll, I'll answer the question, I've just forgotten it. Well, it's about the emotional core, but I'll, I'll, I'll make oh. it more pointed oh. towards uh, Marin Call, which is an interesting thing because you have your subject, right? And while there are other people who appear in the film, they're really just sort of... Cores, yeah. They're little placards or anything, right. like telling you this is the role or this happened. Right. Uh, so he's very much on his own. Yeah. And that's an, in, that's an intentional decision I take it to leave him telling his story in his way. Yeah, I, I, in the end, yeah, yeah, totally. But I mean, the interesting part about documentary is like, I, you know, people go, well, like, like I've had screenings now with, um, you know, brain specialists. But on, it, and it's a great completion of the circle because I had on my list to interview a brain specialist, but it just never felt right to do it right. because his story was so, singular and he was so living by himself and trying to figure it out that it just felt rude to like try and be above him and I wanted to be you know so it just I go back to answer your question now is I think I because I have those people around me to kind of edit me my editing in a way or my thought um, I just try and have a really strong gut about what feels right but what feels wrong because you can have these screenings where you know people really rattle your head but at the end of the day, it's your gut of does this feel right or wrong, yes or no, just over and over and over again. You know, and that's how that's how it works for me. But then I need people to kind of be more analytical, and I hope that they'll care enough, like I do, to to take it from a way like he's talking about, where it's not just analytical; it's analytical for like the emotion of it. You know. Yeah, I'm very. I'm kind of a very practical <clears throat> person, actually, and and I think you know the old kind of cliche of what happens next is, is perfect for me. And I, I think I discover the emotion. Along. There's something magical about movies. I think we can all agree about that. And it's very hard to like, I'm going to make them cry right here. You know, it's, it's, that's very hard to do in a, in a certain way. But what I, I think it is possible to do is to create a mystery almost out of every film so that people are become the audience becomes so engaged in wanting to find out what happens next, what is the next thing, and that they become emotionally involved. And so then the emotions of the characters, are much, it's much easier to transmit them to the audience because they're engaged in seeing what happens next. So I always just try and stick on the what happens next train and, and work the emotion out of that. Yeah, and I think that it was interesting how you're talking about the cove because I felt that, but I could never. It was sort of like the secret recipe of it, of like as long as I was caring about those people, I could enter the story that way. And I think it goes back to something I was trying to say earlier about uh, what documentary can do is if you're engendering that uh, that empathy, mm -hmm. you can really accomplish a lot that people didn't expect when they signed up. You know what I mean? If either getting to know somebody that you would never get to know or caring about an issue that initially you would be it's 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 that empathy that inspires that that change in in viewing it you know what i mean so that's really i find a lot of kind of the secret recipe stuff is is um that people use in whatever format they're doing um is trying to engender empathy in people not just sympathy but true empathy where you're kind of in that role and and feeling how that person would feel you know whether they're trying to save dolphins or trying to figure out what just happened to them or, you know, whatever. Well, producers just have that awful thing about, like, you got to like the characters more, but I agree in totally that it's about empathy, not about liking them right. necessarily. Right, yeah, yeah. I mean, you did, exactly. It's, it's, I always in, uh, think about it as, like, the dinner conversation. Like, at the end of a really nice dinner with some your friend, they might tell you something that they're never going to, like, bring up again. And you guys never talk about it again, but it's 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 there, 
like that's when documentary gets good is like we're all in the dark and 60 minutes in we're so invested that like we might not even speak about it in this way but it's the, that moment in the middle that something happens that um, you could never imagine happening an hour before that. I use that analogy as well. I think it's amazing. Yeah, it, it, I think with these documentaries, they're so, um, they can become so intimate, yeah. no matter the subject, that it always feels like, and, and I, I just, when discussing with directors and editors, like, make it like the best dinner you ever went to, and when you leave, it's like you're leaving too early, but you have to go, right. and you're never going to get it back again. Totally. That's, that's the way you always want to feel. No, you're right. And I think that's also why it's like I always watch them on a Sunday, because yeah, yeah. you're like in that headspace, and you're not always in the mood to watch them. You're like, I just can't do it tonight, you know, because <laughs> it's like, because you know you're going to a place that's more personal and more, you know, and you're going to get something that's, that, you know, works outside of what narrative typically, typically gives you, at least in American narrative, you know, it's, it's more kind of straight. Well, talking about this empathy thing, it's interesting. I, I mean, Mark, I, I certainly believe you're great at what happens next, what comes next, right? And and the cove works that way. But I don't think that movie works for me, at least, without my empathy for Rick O'Berry mm -hmm. and that and that thing of like, there's a guy who's clearly haunted by what he <laughs> perceives to be his role right. in, in making dolphins attractive to Americans right. and, and others. Uh, and what was so that story had to come along too. Is that something you found? Was that already there? Yeah, I know. Look, I mean, uh, you know, when I sat down with Louis for like a weekend long dinner uh, to go over this <laughs> whole thing, you know, and he's telling me this story, and it's this guy, and he's unbelievable. He's found this cove, and by the way, he trained Flipper. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, and and and, uh, and he just goes into this whole kind of you know, how it, how this is what America does. You know, we make industries out of things. That's, that's what we do. We figure out a way to monetize things and make it so everyone can do it. And, and that's what he's done. And, and, you know, when you learn these things, you're like, you, you're spellbound just over that dinner conversation. And so, yeah, that was, you know, we knew that, you know, Louis was kind of the, the, the brains, the vehicle of the piece to a certain extent. But Rick was the heart, right. you know. And as long as you kept going back to that heart, you know, you'd be fine, you know. So I guess what I'm asking is, did Louis recognize the significance of Rick O'Berry? Yeah, he did. He did. Okay, absolutely. He, I mean, uh, Rick has had a long career of uh, activism, mm -hmm. and there, you know, um, I think anybody who's butting their head up against a wall for so many years, sometimes they they feel like a, it's a recording you're listening to, and that you know. That was a, a little bit of a trick to try to make Rick as likable as possible because he was very, um, he had some hard edges to him to a certain extent and you had to reveal that past and let him reveal it, you know, uh, with you. And so there was a point where we were like, we don't want it to be the Rick O'Berry movie right. because he is like, you know, he's on a one track mission, mm -hmm. right? And that's all that matters to him. And, and we wanted to do more things within the film. Uh, but there was never any doubt that he was the heart of the film. You know, that was always going to be the case. Well, finding that heart seems so critical. And, I, you know, I was just uh, at a work in progress screening for a documentary about the, uh, maybe someone will, will know the filmmaker, but uh, about the Stanford uh, marching band play, the football oh. thing. Right? And it's a, it's a really interesting documentary. And they go talk to all the players except for one of them. And afterwards, they're like, what, what's that? What's that about? <laughs> Why did you leave out that guy? And he says, like, oh, it's this thing, like, he's, he's now spending life in prison. And, and, it's like, <laughs> and I, said, I said, excuse me, what? <laughs> what? He, said, he said, it just seemed like a long road to go down. It's sort of depressing. It's like, ah, 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 ah. He goes, like, and then, and then he adds, the like, hypocrite. yeah, it's the only, thing, that, it's, it's the only thing that's giving him hope in the world. Like, and, and, and you chose to leave that out? <laughs> right. But, I mean, it's, it's funny because you were talking about that thing with the oh and he you know he worked on flipper and he trained flipper yeah, right. it, it, it's often that thing that you initially ignore and it's sort of that dinner where you're like wait a second let's go down this road <laughs> and and as an audience member i think you get to feel that sometimes of like okay this is not our straight the narrative's going here but we're going to take this really interesting side road that's going to connect mm -hmm. you know and and but it is weird when you're trying to do it how you can be blind to those things and that's why i think you need other people to put that in relief because so often it's it's that really interesting tidbit that does not have to do with your story that 
entirely has to do with your story, you know, and you need to start rethinking what your story is because it's going to tell you, you know. So, but so what? Did, what was his response? Because <laughs> <laughs> this is. I mean, the we're, we're, key. Like, it's, a, it's a continuing conversation. Yeah, well, like, it's a good it, conversation. It, it, it's more of an having. argument because yeah. it started as a as a, just a conversation, a talk back after the the screening. And I was trying to be polite because it was a fundraiser too, and all this like. Uh, but all I, uh, in the back of my head, all I could hear myself saying was like, "Are you fucking kidding me?" Uh, <laughs> so we, we, we've we've met since then, and right. and uh, he's asked me to explain why I think that's right. important, and I said, yeah. I said, "I think we have a problem here." <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, this is this is not, not unusual. No, this is not uncommon <laughs> to the point where I don't know about you. I, I can tell. I have a certain friend who does that with me at screenings, where he's like, he gives that slight c cocked head of like, <laughs> you're out of your mind, and I have to like know like, oh, and he's very smart, and he's a story analyst, and you have to like acknowledge the fact that he thinks you're crazy for not for what you just said, right. and it, and it is that back and forth of like finding the the right play, the right zone there. You know? So just invite me to dinner and I'll be that guy. Going. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, I think, think we missed don't something. you, even you, who, who sometimes uh, hired to come into that situation that's gotten maybe uh, muddier than when it started, you know, that kind of commentary is invaluable, right? Because uh, kick, getting your head kicked is, is, is really, <laughs> or so to speak, <laughs> like, you know. You is, can never is, not get your head kicked in these yeah. things. Yeah. You <laughs> always think Barring call two. You, you, <laughs> yeah. you, you always think that you, you know, oh, we figured it out. We figured it out. That's like, the you know, right. you, you're saying it to yourselves all the time. Like, yeah. oh, my gosh, we figured it out. Oh, that's going to work perfectly. We figured it out. Yeah. And then the first time you show something to someone, you get kicked in the head, and you're like, right. Even How are we so stupid that right. we did that? <laughs> Sometimes and even it, it without even without them saying anything, just like watching oh, I it know. through their eyes, <laughs> you're like, oh, this is just I've this been lying to myself. Wreck. What have we? Done? <laughs> yeah, totally. yeah. So uh, it, it happens on every single film. Every single film, you think that you have solved it, only to realize what a big problem you have. You know, in, in a certain section of the film, it never. It's never. And I think that's. For people who are doing it for the first time, that's very daunting. Right. And so yeah. I, 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 I feel like sometimes my role is, uh, is like the therapist. Like, no, no, it's okay. <laughs> this is what, we're, this this is what we want. <laughs> right. We want to get kicked in the head tonight. Trust me, it's going to happen. We want to do it because it's going to be so, it's going to lead us in the right direction. So right. don't worry, they're going to hate it. It's going to be fine, though. <laughs> I don't think that makes you a therapist. I think that makes you a sadist on, on some level. Uh, but, uh, could be wrong. I'd like to open it up uh, to questions from you guys. Yes? I had kind of a basic question, a little bit more on the technical side, if you would. Could you explain a little bit about the audio track and the, the script that evolved out of that? Because you talked about editing and cutting. The audio track... Uh, so for the final uh, track, how does that evolve? Well, I mean, it is, a, uh, like I say, an editor's kind of uh, genre. And, and I think a lot of it is is uh, experiment, experimenting with the audio to, and, and also getting the right order uh, of, uh, of statements within the film. That these scenes are, are kind of crafted sometimes by who says what when. Right, yeah. So No, totally. I mean, I know it's somewhat of a dirty word, but I really think that radio cut idea yeah. in television is super helpful. Where, you know, it's an interesting question you say that because sometimes when that first building block to try and tell the story after you've shot everything is what's called a radio cut, right? Where um, it's just, what are we hearing when? You know, and, and although it's a visual medium and you want to make it as visual as possible, that's a pretty effective way to, to have, you know, a baseline on what your story is. We, I mean, a lot of times, <clears throat> the, because I am working off transcripts of what people say, and I'm placing bites, sound bites of what people say within the, the, within the thing. Uh, I always am putting too many bites in. And uh, w um, uh, w I call it sometimes the scaffolding, right? You're building a, a tower. Totally. I think it's scaffolding, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, totally. And then you realize after a while. You don't need all those, you know, it's, you're communicating it visually and with, uh, with other means. You don't need everyone to say everything all the time. But my job is to try to build the tower first. And so... I'm always, I have too many people talking, the people are saying too many things, and then you're slowly taking things out and seeing what, how much you can take out and keep the tower standing, right. basically. And then on an audio track level, it's interesting when, as you're working to see what your music is accomplishing versus what your bites are accomplishing. 
because sometimes they're accomplishing the same thing and it can tend to seem like a little much or kind of overdone. Redundant. Yeah, exactly. Whereas if your music is doing something else or sometimes, frankly, even undercutting what someone's saying if you're trying to like, or if it just feels right to kind of question that or to, you know what I mean? So the audio is really kind of everyone's clue. I mean, obviously with the visuals, but it's amazing how much you can accomplish that way with the audio because you, you start to think of it in like kind of like a band format, right? Like you've got your dialogue and you got your music and you got your sound effects and what are all those things choosing to do? Is somebody backing somebody up? Is somebody taking the lead? Is somebody, you know, doing the chorus? You know, what? so I always try and think of it in that way. I, I love this scaffolding idea and, and this notion seemingly of uh, narrative Jenga that you're playing here. How do you know when you have removed just enough <laughs> you don't. You don't? <laughs> <coughs> no, that's usually, usually, yeah, it falls down. And that's, that's literally the case, is that uh, it goes back to that kind of communicating, that intent. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when you have everyone saying the same thing or saying the things to hold the tower up, everyone understands completely. They're a little bit bored, but they understand what you're saying. And, uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's when you start screening the film and the version you think is the best version with, you know, taking a lot of those sound bites out, whether that is still being communicated or not. That's actually a really big one that I feel like I always give advice to people and then I find myself uh, needing to hear it from other people is that say it once, which is because I, I, it's weird when you watch films that say, well, this is important, so I'm going to say it twice. Uh, it's weird, like, I feel like you get an audience that's on their heels rather than on their toes because they're like, hey, if it's important, I'm going to hear it twice. You know, as opposed to like, oh, I got to pay attention here. Right. So, you know, depending on what you're doing, I think that, you know, you need to always, like, respect the audience to, like, go with you. Because if, if you are doing, if, if your music is saying the same thing as your bites and you've got one too many bites, no one's going to tell you that. But they're going to feel, they're going to tune out. You know what I mean? They're going to tune out. We call it, Wait. another thing we, uh, we like to call it is uh, uh, if you can get them on the train and then keep them on the train. Right. Basically. Yeah, and, yeah. and sometimes that's a function of um, allowing them to, like, being ahead of them on a what happens next way, right. but also, like, um, allowing them to ask that question. Right. You know, like, I'm, no, I'm cutting now, I'm rough cutting the next movie, and I sometimes I'll look back on a scene and it's like, you know, and my wife, who's one of the people who saves me from myself editorially, uh, <laughs> producing-wise, is always going like, no, that's what you want the audience to feel. That's n you don't want to say that. You know, and, and it's interesting that sometimes you just want to pull that, even though you're saying exactly what you, th right. like, wow, I found the bite. That's, yeah. that's, that's the bite. The, the guy said exactly what I think. Yeah. yeah, I should put that in, right? And it's like, no, that sometimes the job is to get the audience to, like, you know, think that themselves. Yeah, think that for you. Yeah, that makes them an active participant exactly. at that point. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And now, now you got them. <laughs> yes, in the back there. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that was that was that's a really good way to put it. And I think that I was lucky enough to be able to put that, I hope, in some unspoken way, into Marvel Call if you see it, because, like I said, I wanted to recreate for the audience the experience, not the whole experience, like Mark was saying, which is a problem, but like that experience of like maybe judging someone or thinking you know them, and then having them constantly surprise you, because that was my. I remember the first weekend I was shooting Marvel Call when I thought it was a short talking to a friend of mine at like midnight in a parking lot going, this guy showed me his shoes and that's not what I'm shooting and you know, what's going on? And if you know the film, you know that's like the heart of the film really. And, um, and my friend smartly, who is Tom Putnam, who's a documentary filmmaker was like, no, this is what you want. You know what I mean? Like, but you can get caught in this trap of like, well, this is my hypothesis, right? So it's the scientific methods is actually a really interesting way to do it because it keeps you honest of like, okay, I have preconceived ideas, but I'm willing to have them like smashed 
once I do my experiment. So that's actually a neat Yeah, way. I mean, this is what I was saying earlier about the difference between shooting a narrative and shooting a doc. And the, and if you're going to direct a documentary, I mean, the best thing you can do is, is be able to listen and be able to go with it and not, not be afraid of where it's going to take you. And that's, I think, why the, the, the Cove turned out so well, because Louis had no notion of going to Japan <laughs> and trying to get cameras past you know, fishermen with long knives. <laughs> you know, that was not his game plan at all. He was like on a fancy boat, diving in crystal clear water, hanging out, and suddenly he met this guy, and, and eventually that's where it took him. Right, yeah, I think you're lucky if it takes you a place you don't expect to go. Because th some of the films that I really don't vibe with, I'll talk to the filmmaker and it sounds like they did exactly what they're planning. You know, and it can't be as good as what actually happens, right? Like, that's always the lesson. So it's like you have to be comfortable with that fact. You know? But it's interesting because in, in uh, not so much the shooting, but in the construction of these things after the fact, Mark, your work seems to do a thing where, like, you there is an idea of where the film is going. You set that up. This is what we're this is what we're doing. This is the ride we're going on. Whereas Marin Call, uh, which I uh, admire just as much, is something where it really requires the audience to be patient because you really have no idea where that's headed. Yeah, but it's still a construct. I mean, it's still like that same equation. It's just a different recipe. But, I mean, but you don't say like, wait, there'll be a surprise in the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think yeah, you, no, you're right. But I've thought about that a lot actually because I think you get away with that because his first story that you think it's, I mean, and it is about that, but is interesting enough that it has enough sizzle, so to speak, right, to buy you that time. You know, because it's a guy who builds this world out of dolls in his backyard because he was beat up. I mean, you can keep going with that story while you're building another story, but were it a normal person and you're waiting 60 minutes for the movie to turn around and everything means something else, I don't think people would have the patience for it. So it was always a function of like, how, how much can you get away with? And, and yes, I wanted them to be patient, but it's like, um, you know, slow, like I wanted it like slow, but not too slow. You know what I mean? Like you, you still had to have those breadcrumbs. And if you didn't, forget it. Nobody would pay any attention. Uh, and also, I mean, if if people, if editors just did what I suggested, right. the movies, no one would like the movies because, <laughs> I mean, a lot of my job is to actually like have the broom behind me and and try to clear my footprints. You know right. what I'm saying? It's because I am constructing things from from shot material, known material, stuff that people have been working on for several years sometimes, and I am literally kind of like trying to construct a narrative out of it. But part of the magic of documentaries is um, that they need to take you places you didn't know you were going to go a little bit. And so um, my, you know, my initial kind of outline or construct is, is never, I always think, you know, if I bat 350, I'm in the Hall of Fame, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's the way I kind of look at it with these, with these scenes. I'm just like, I'm going to get you in the ballpark, man, and yeah. we're going to go this way, and we'll both discover, you know, where it's going to lead us. Yeah, it's like holding on to the reins, but not too tight. Right, exactly. You know, like you're guiding it, but it's you're allowing for, you know, that happy accident. You said something earlier that we all always say, is that especially in docs, these films will start telling you right. where they're going. That's when you know you're that's cooking. When you, it's that's like when you're boiling cooking. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. <laughs> Some filmmakers ignore that, but uh, they are talking to you. Yes, in the back. I love how specific yeah, that this hypothetical is. This is not a generic <laughs> example, I can tell. <laughs> it's, right. it's like, it's like very a very well thought out hypothetical. <laughs> it's a documentary's dream problem right there. Let me tell you that. That's, like, that's a so, good problem to so have. People from Hollywood are coming and offering you money. I don't know. <laughs> uh, no, sorry. Uh, okay, so, wow, I was well, kind of hoping look, you would. I don't know well, why I ended up I'll, on the I'll say, that, you know, 
I think, and this is a bigger, I don't know if I can answer directly, but I think over the last, certainly we all know that over the last 10 years, 15 years, you've seen the rise of documentaries, essentially. They, they, there are more documentaries out there than ever before. There are more venues, avenues for them to be seen. And I personally think as our, as our news cycle is, is short attention span theater and it's so split between the left and the right and no one believes any of it because it, either it's the left, the left version or the right's version, that the documentaries are being seen really as the truth. The people, that's why you see like CNN buying documentaries because if someone's gonna put four or five years of their life into it, people think well, that must be true. You know, <laughs> the documentary must be true because I, the, the news is not. So uh, I think part of the savviness has been Hollywood uh, getting involved in documentaries to exactly that extent you're talking about. And this great film from a few years ago won the, the uh, Academy Award Undefeated. Weinstein Company bought Undefeated because they bought the life rights to Undefeated because they wanted to make a feature film about Undefeated. I mean, certainly they bought it because they thought they'd make money on, on that uh, documentary just on, on its own. But part of that equation was that we want the rights so we can make a feature film. I think that's the, you know, a great problem for a documentary <laughs> maker to have. I, I, I live in, in Los Angeles, uh, as is Jeff. You know, we, we can't get arrested. <laughs> in Los Angeles half the time, you know, uh, by, by the narrative side of things. And so for that to, to, to happen, uh, for Undefeated, I think bodes well for all of us. I, I hope that, uh, you know, they keep picking documentaries to make films about because the documentary stories, I think, are great and, and are very vital to what's happening in our lives right now. So. Yeah. I, I think that that comes with... Uh, right. Right. Yeah, I, 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 sure. Yeah, I think in the scenario, and I totally agree with what Mark's saying. Um, I, I really think it's, you know, I always liked those people who worked really hard on books that were beautiful and lovely and transformative and people's favorite books, and then they became Hollywood movies, and those people were able to keep ma writing books, you know what I mean? So if, if it's a, no, serious, if it's a case like that, where it's like, you know, money is really tight in documentary, you know, and as, but the difference to me is as long as there's an acknowledgement of the documentary as the inspiration or the source material, then I have no problem with it. I mean, I, I don't know about you guys, but I don't have a lot of faith in Hollywood to, to make a great movie out of a, a m m almost anything except for a comic book. So... <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 I maybe <laughs> because I live there and I'm a bit cynical, I would assume that they're probably not going to make the best, you know, version of the documentary. But I set out to make the documentary, right. and I think that that, you know, that's always that can stand on its own. Exactly, it's yeah. gonna stand on its own forever. Yeah. And and if people go see the movie version and think, ah, that's crap, maybe I'll go see the documentary. That's even better. Right. Or it so. inspires a conversation. Or you know, hopefully you're working on something like The Cove or, you know, Marvin Call or something where it's the the subject material is bigger, and the story and the issue and is bigger than the documentary itself. So it's it's a natural that somebody wants to you know do a different take or something like that on it. But I would be real careful in the situation you're talking about. I, I think it's um, it has changed in the last ten years, but I don't think the laws have changed. So you really need to protect yourself in terms of you know if your work is transformative, if your work is um, something that you know, is beyond, because sometimes documentary can be viewed, viewed as kind of source news material, um, which I, in my mind, it's not. Um, so you, ha you, you have to be buttoned up in that way, I think, um, of with your subjects about um, that, because it's a lot of hard work. And if that situation happens, you have to um, just kind of be prepared for it ahead of time, um, because then you eliminate that downside because there are um, certain people I've talked to who feel like you can just take that story whole and you know maybe they have a case and maybe they don't you know depending on the situation but as a filmmaker I want to be able to protect my subjects I want to be able to pr protect myself and my work that I worked hard on so as there are more and more of those adaptations and conversions, though, I think, and, and people don't read anymore, I think it's just a matter of, like, books, see the documentary first, <laughs> then see the, the fiction film, because the doc generally has the good stuff. Right. And for all those people who liked Captain Phillips this year, I really will recommend going back to Stolen Seas, even though it's not, you know, exactly the same. 
Stolen Seas actually moved me in a way that Captain Phillips didn't, despite how well made that is. Yes, over there, sir, on the right. Well, I I didn't go out there, uh, but that's a great story, the, the the story of that film. Uh, and I and I to to your final uh, to to one point of that film, I think it, uh, Chasing Ice is a great um, is a uh, talk about patience and perseverance. Ch Chasing Ice was a film that uh, was made. The director of that film was at the time I met him, he was 25, 26, Jeff Orlowski, who was in the film, uh, and. Uh, you know, he had gone out and shot this stuff with uh, James Balog and lived the story, and he did the same thing we were talking about earlier, where, you know, he had, had contacted me through some people, uh, but he was trying to kind of relive the, his experience a little bit uh, of making that uh, 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 trek, and he had so much wonderful, amazing stuff. I just thought it was fantastic. And... Uh, we worked on that film for several years, uh, but he was also editing the film himself, and he had lived it. And he wasn't, you know, uh, he was 26, 27. He wasn't like, uh, you know, uh, I don't think he would call himself a professional editor in any way, shape, or form. And we actually got uh, um, uh, an offer on the film, you know, not a great offer, but an offer, and it seemed like, wow, you know, we did something. But he was smart enough to listen to people around him, not, n you know, not just me, uh, smarter people than me, <laughs> to, to say, you know, this can be so much better. And he found an editor, uh, Davis Coombe, an unbelievable editor in Denver, to help him reshape that film. And it's basically the same story we had, but it was just done in, in, in a way that editorially made it just come alive. Uh, and so, uh, and I think that film does what the best documentaries can do, which is kind of push the needle of the conversation. It doesn't mean that everyone has to see the documentary, um, but it can change a few people's minds and it can get people talking about it. And then before you know it, we feel differently about climate change a little bit. And, and I think you need a thousand more things like that to happen to totally change the topic. And that's what these films are best at, I think, is kind of planting a seed of change. Not my part, no, sir. I was in a room. I may have <laughs> clipped a fingernail. I don't, you know. The coffee was hot one morning. My, my pride was bruised several times. <laughs> but uh, no, we, uh, we didn't have any injuries. Uh, I didn't have any injuries. James Baylock had uh, several uh, knee surgeries. James is, a, is an unstoppable force. He's a crazy uh, man. You know, he had these knees that were going bad. He had the surgery. The doctors tell him. We actually didn't put as much. Uh, uh, in the first cut, we had more of it in. It was quite hysterical of the doctor literally saying, now, James, you cannot do this. The, you know, the crampons and going down, that is a no-no. You do not do that. And then you just cut to Iceland, and he's literally like, I'm just going to go down this. <laughs> and, and, and literally, you can hear Jeff. He's holding the camera. He goes, James, isn't this what the doctor told you not to do? <laughs> It's <laughs> like, you know, it was, it was, and, and you just know that the guy's going to keep going. He's not, he's not going to stop, you know, and his wife was like, you know, the hiking is over, and you just turn to James, and he's like, the well, hiking's not over. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I can imagine he's probably going to have more injuries, unfortunately, because he's just, he's not going to stop, you know, so. The rough and tumble life of the documentary screenwriter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's a three-parter. I'm going to make three sure part, you get yeah, them all. Oh yeah. Go ahead. Well, 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 the first thing I'd like to say is about Sylvia Earle, and I hope everyone has a chance to see this film. It's, it's Tomorrow, 9.30 uh, at the Armory. It's, it's, thank you. It's, uh, 
you know, and I think it, it, this holds true for a lot of uh, <coughs> documentary films, is that you're, you, the first priority as far as uh, the audience, to me, when making it, is that the person who's in it sees it and goes, that's real. That, that's the truth. And that happened to me, and that's the essence of what I'm trying to do. When, when you can show your film to your subject and they look at it and go, wow, that is actually the truth. That's, that's well put. And, and sometimes like a portrait, like some, th some aspect of themselves that maybe they didn't see. Right. Because it needs to be good for them too. Like they're sitting there for years, <laughs> right. you know, being invaded on some level. So. Right. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, the, the Mission Blue was, uh, I would say, definitely a collaboration with Sylvia Earle because we wanted to serve her. We wanted to make sure that this is, this is a woman who's underappreciated in our view, greatly underappreciated, a pioneer, a woman who's gone places and done things no one else in the world has ever done. And like I always tell people, you know, when I was in like fifth grade, sixth grade, no one reads books anymore, I know, but uh, you, you used to have to read books <laughs> and you do book reports on like Jackie Robinson and Abe Lincoln, you know, and, and this is a woman who should have book reports done on her every year by every fifth grader. And so, um, in, in that in, in that instance, yeah, we were we were definitely, uh, you know, uh, working on her behalf almost. So, uh, as far as uh, the role of a writer, you know, everyone I get asked that a lot, and uh, I, you know, I think it's, uh, I think it's just a term that is being used. Uh, that uh, um, it's the work is being done whether there's a writer credit or not. The work is being done whether there's writer credit. It's to me, it's basically structuring the film. It's not actually sometimes writing anything. I, I don't usually even write my own words to put in these films. A lot of times, I am merely structuring the film, trying to find the, 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 the stacking of the story so that it is the, the most effective. And I think it, that's what an editor does. I know that's what an editor does and has done for years. Uh, and... Uh, for whatever reason, that credit, you know, became recognized by the WGA, and that's where I've fallen into. But it, it doesn't matter if you have a writer credit or not. If you have a good documentary, I think someone is writing. Yeah, so. good point. Yeah, somebody's writing it with something, whether it's editing or writing. It's that work is being done, um, and you know, the director. Some it has to be done um, by someone. <laughs> They may only be labels, but I think what's funny in speaking with you, Mark, is that I, I think the more accurate term would be to borrow something from theater and think of you as a dramaturg for, for yeah. documentaries, you know, that you're helping somebody find their story and how best to communicate it. Uh, I, I just always find that more accurate in terms of how you isn't, describe it, certainly. Isn't there also, too, like, supervising editor in a way? Like, if you, were, if you were literally in front of a machine, sometimes it might be that role, too, which I feel like narrative had that in the 70s more, of mm -hmm. like an editor who would get in there and, and figure out the story, right. in addition to like cutting from A to B, like what is our story, you know, when there were more doc-based narratives in the 70s. Yes, sir. Um, I was uh, kind of wondering, uh, you know, back to the editing and clipping, you know, your clipping technique. Right. But when you As if you said it uh, right in the question that you just as an audience, I just pretend I'm watching a movie like all day long, but I'm also right. You know what I mean? And like, what would I want to see? And so, yeah, I just think of it as an audience. And his question was like, how, how do you kind of forget that you started on frame 72 and ended on frame 306? And there was this other thing that had to do with this other thing. It's just constantly thinking like you're the first person watching this, to me. But I'm sure people have different tricks. Because I would think, like if I was doing a Stanford thing, and um, you know, I knew that once I had gone to prison, I was trying to edit that film, but the director didn't want me to like put that in. You have a way down. Uh, th as the director, <laughs> right, rightly so. His comment would, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's hope so. Um, no, um, yeah, absolutely. And that's that push pull is the really interesting thing about Doc. I mean, if you listen to what we, it, all our answers seem to be this thing of like sort of not knowing and knowing. It's it's that kind of 
having to listen to everybody and yet have a firm opinion. And, and, and it's a real, you know, you're, you're cluing into like the thing that's the, the most difficult. And frankly, if you can get it through it, the most uh, important thing and the most meaningful thing in doc is, is sort of, you know, at the end of the day, you have to have an opinion, but you better have like listened to everybody and incorporated it all. So it's, it's maddening in that way a little bit. It's that funny thing that happens at panels and master classes and stuff where it seems like people are expecting there to be an answer and approach right, to something. Yeah. Whereas when you talk to great folks like this, it's clear that it's an art form and there's some there's some leap of faith that you take in terms of knowing your right, story. Right, I think there? it's interesting you were talking about all the tricks, like I always think about scaffolding too, or like you did a baseball analogy, I'm always, it's a documentary so much about failure and like you're right one out of four times just like baseball or whatever. And um, so you have these little tricks and stuff, but if we were to sit here and work on a movie the way we're talking about working on a movie right now, it, we would go mad because you have to just go with your gut and occasionally you have these little tricks to, to help you out and write them down or whatever. Yes. No, it does. I would prefer it happen that way, actually. Uh, uh, I don't know if I could survive if it happened that way, but I would prefer it happen that way. I, I have uh, been fortunate to work on uh, several films um, in which I'm brought in uh, to write a treatment before anything is shot. And, you know, I'm, I'm told the story and I'm told what the intent is and I'm told what we're trying to do and who we have and, and these events that happen that have been captured and, and what we're hoping to shoot. And, and I can sit there with the, um, with the director and kind of go, well, if, you know, if I were in your shoes, this is what I would do. You know, I would structure it like this. I would try to get these people on camera, and I would try to shoot these things. And then I write a treatment based on the, the, you know, the faith and belief that that's going to happen. And then that treatment is taken out in the world, and we try to raise money. And I've been successful a couple times at doing that. And that, then, then, then you have kind of the good and the bad. You have the blueprint of what you're trying to do, but you, you can't be kind of caught up in that blueprint so that when it you know, goes awry and you, you, you suddenly are filming something you never thought in a million years would happen, you're like, oh, blueprint's gotta change. Right. Throw that treatment out, <laughs> here we go. Right. Well, I think that there are a few more docu-series kind of shows out there that are a little bit more faithful to the documentary form. When I was working a lot in television, there were not. There was reality television, which is anything but reality. Right. And, and then there were these biography-style shows where you, you knew going in, you have you know a, a set amount of money and a set amount of time, and you better have your edit done in five weeks. Right. And it's like, okay, we're going to tell this guy's life story, and this is going to be the flashpoint, this is going to be this, this is going to be that, and we're going to get these people... And so there was not a lot of uh, you know room for play, but now I think with the uh, with uh, with reality TV has come some more kind of docu style programming, in which people are just following people around and making stories out of them. I think you see them more on uh, you know your um, your Bravos of the world or, or your pay cable stations, but um, even those. You know, there's an intent because when you're working in television, there's there's always a bottom line. There's a there's a schedule you have to adhere to and a, and a finite amount of cash. Whereas documentaries, there is no cash and you can work forever. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that, that's finite. That's, that's a very good summary, actually. Okay. We we have time for one more. I'll take the lovely lady in front.
Huh? Uh, yeah, a couple of years ago. Um, no. Well, I mean, what's what's technology-wise, what's interesting to me now is uh, the Netflix instant, like it's on Netflix. Like, I would love to see a, a, a pie chart of how people have seen Marwan Call, and I think the large portion of it would be Netflix instant, even though it played in 100 cities theatrically, even though we played all these festivals and did all these things. Um, it played on PBS, it, but like when you look at um, how, p particularly documentaries, I feel like people really, are, you know, it's like it's sitting down wanting an experience, and it's it's you know more interesting than a lot of the material they have on there, frankly. So um, so for me personally, I, if I can't see something at a film festival, I just write a, down a list, wait six months, and pray that it's either on Netflix Instant or Amazon Instant or Fandor is really good. F Fandor, F-A-N-D-O-R, which is sort of uh, much more um, kind of arts-oriented uh, Netflix, uh, but same idea, streaming. And all of Mark's films are available on <laughs> <laughs> Blu-ray and DVD. Uh, uh, but there will be a screening tomorrow morning, as you mentioned, of uh, Mission Blue, 9.30 at the Armory, uh, uh, Written by <laughs> Rogue Award winner Mark Monroe, so please go see that. There will also <laughs> you can you can applaud for that. That's fine. <laughs> Jeff Malmberg's Marin Call is available on uh, on Netflix and in uh, at Scarecrow Video in Seattle for those who because there are still yeah, video stores. And also, just a round of applause for Jeff for having to endure that whole six months in Italy uh, in the hill town <laughs> with his wife. Thank you. Thank you for no, I, coming out. I, I appreciate you bringing it up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Uh, <laughs>